So, uh, hey, uh, before we start this episode, we just like to say, so yeah, that was quite some election. <laughs> yeah, a lot of shit is very scary for a lot of people right now, and we just want to say our heart goes out to everyone affected by this election, which is just about everybody. Also, Stay we safe. recorded this episode far <laughs> before the, all this happened, so if we yep. make any jokes that are very, very hurtful in hindsight, now you know. Yep, so we apologize for that. I actually don't remember which things, but um, this was recorded before then, so some things may be out of date or, in retrospect, less good. Uh, <laughs> please please try to stay safe. Try to help which people you can, and do what you can to help each other. For all you people who don't live in America, just give your American friends as much love and support as you can right now. <laughs> And Absolutely. remember, remember, no matter how bad things get, at least we can all agree that Ricky Gervais seriously needs to get out of my closet. I cannot get sleep. He keeps waking me up at night to know if I've been triggered. It's getting annoying. He keeps it asking if I'm offended. <laughs> it's yeah. getting really annoying. I'm not offended. I'm just trying to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, now for the episode, we talk about gay stuff. Hello and welcome back to IndieScent, another video game podcast no one listens to. Because we don't have enough of those. <laughs> but at least we don't complain about the SJWs or anything like that, so we're already way better than most of the pack out there. It's the truth. I really wish that wasn't the truth. <laughs> Anyways, uh, this, uh, I am, uh, Dark, uh, the person you just heard uh, talking after me was Lamar, and we also have Elmo with us. Hello. He's very like British, party. and we still blame him for Ricky Gervais. And I will I not let that countdown. go. <laughs> oh, yeah, you he were was on. on Countdown. Tell us about Countdown. Yeah. Well, it's a show. If you're listening in January 2017, watch out for me on Countdown. There you go. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> they aired these things very ahead of schedule. Yeah. Oh, we're off to well, a great start. Yeah. Just like we do, because this is probably going to go up much later than this time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're so timely. We're recording this before the Westport Independence episode is even out yet. <laughs> yep. And that one, we name dropped the actual date it's on, so oops. <laughs> We're very professional here. Anyways, uh, what happens every episode is at the end, um, one of us uh, picks a game for us to go over for the next episode, and we go in a cycle. Last time it was my pick, so I picked a game with lesbians in it, because if you've known me for more than five minutes, you understand that's all I needed to know. Only five minutes? <laughs> Anyways, I uh, picked out a game I've been meaning to talk about for a while but never had an excuse to because I cannot, for the life of me, pitch a hard visual novel like this to my editor at the place I write at, Hardcore Gaming 101. Please go check out my articles. Hashtag like and subscribe. Retweet. Reblog. Validate my existence. Friend him on MySpace. Buy my album. Watch me on Countdown. <laughs> Post my dank Pepe. So now, so now that we've got all the plugs out of the way. <laughs> Anyways, the game we're talking about today is a little different because this is a, a, a first episode, or in this case, episode zero, of a game that's still in development. But I wanted to talk about it because I follow the uh, owner of the studio behind this, a uh, guy named Towsom, I think that's how you pronounce it. He's the main artist, writer, and the head of a group called Lupe Soft, who are uh, making visual novels and actually have another one coming out. By the time this episode's out, it'll already be out on Steam called The Stargazers. And so I want to, uh, sorry, talk about one of their uh, first released games that 
I really think deserves more attention than it's gotten because it's very gay and I love it. It's called uh, The Reject Demon Toko and this is the uh, prologue episode of it. Episode Zero. Or is it? <laughs> it is. It, it is. is. Yeah. <laughs> Spoiler. It's even named Prelude, so there you go. Pretty much. Yeah. This is going to be an interesting one to talk about because I didn't realize when I suggested it that it was this hard of a visual novel. I thought there would be like like some sort of RPG element thrown in or something, but no, it's just a straight up novel part of a visual novel. Lots of words, lots of pictures, and you go through them. There's no choices, just go through it. Mm. But I am okay with that because I think what they presented was entertaining on its own and that's really what matters and also it doesn't take five goddamn hours to get started and it's not Sakura Spirit (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Lamar uh, Lamar, how long does it take for the first uh, prologue chapter of Fate State Night to finish Uh, I think the beginning of that by the time Lancer shows up I think it's like an hour Jesus. To be fair, there's a lot to set up. And and, uh, the, and it's like, just to be fair with this one, this is basically all set up, so. Yeah. It, well, for one thing, unlike uh, Fade Stay Night, things actually happen as it's setting stuff up. So uh, it doesn't bore you I'm, to tears. I, I'll, I'll, say, I'll save my thoughts for later, but... Uh, no, I mean... I mean Fate St- as, in Fate as, as, a light, as a light spoiler, I didn't really like this game much. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go like rag on it endlessly because no, people put effort into this, but I, this really did not do anything for me. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh well, we can't like everything all the time. It's true. If we did, uh, we'd all probably like everything eventually. And that's terrible. It's we happy few. <laughs> oh god, don't remind me about that. <laughs> that game makes me an unhappy few. <laughs> I hope they fix it, but they won't. Hey, here's a really interesting idea for a game with a really interesting concept. Oh, it's a survival game with a bunch of meters crafting you have to keep filling. It's a survival game with crafting so elements. Original. It's just the newest way to make me not give a shit about whatever game comes out. Just... Oh, this really interesting idea. Also, it's a survival game with crafting elements. Never mind. It's done. <laughs> That's fun. Every time, like clockwork. The kids these days with their Minecrafts and their Rust. Pokemons. Boy, we're just really on topic, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> it's the truth. Yeah. Welcome to uh, Indie Scent, people. This is how they usually go. Yeah. Anyways, uh, I found out about this game because a friend of mine was uh, tweeting about it and uh, just like showing all these really gay scenes and uh, eventually I noticed some other people liked it, were talking about it. I eventually found the uh, developer on Twitter and started following them because I really love the art style of this game. And I finally decided to just get around and talk about it since I we have this podcast now and I figured it's as good as time as any. And I was pleasantly surprised by it. Like, for me, visual novels kind of scare me because, like, the really hard ones, like, really mostly novel ones, are just so dry and drawn out or they are re- just stupid in all the wrong ways and it's even worse when you try finding a good western visual novel because those if you've seen the same storefronts and noticed all those anime titty games that are everywhere these days guess who made them what we're saying is at least it's it's not soccer spirit (laughs) oh yeah thank god yeah According There's to like TV 20 of those soccer games. I really do not get that. people's fascination with that when uh, we have Gender Bender DNA Twister Extreme sitting Stop right this. there. <laughs> You're done. And it is a million times that worse is, That is your far one mention of that game. <laughs> we will now continue. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey. Un- no. Soccer Spirit is a bad, we all understand its titty. 
Gender Bender DNA Twister Extreme is the type of bad you have to experience. <laughs> no. Uh, anyway, we just going to mention it every single week until we play it. Yes. We're not playing yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> just wait until decided. I get my next big payday. I will buy it all for you. <laughs> and it is complete now, so there's no more waiting around. God damn Yippee. it. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I was trying to put my finger on uh, what this art style reminded me of, because I've never really seen uh, character designs quite like this. The closest I could come up with was a cross between the designs from Disgaea and this one Dojin artist I know that did a really good uh, Rukia Fendom Dojin. <laughs> It's weird I, that you mentioned Fade earlier, because actually with the uh, art style, a lot of the shading mainly actually reminds me a bit of uh, Fade Extra, which I have not played, but have seen pictures of, which is basically the same. Hmm. Yeah, I've uh, heard about it. Uh, crap, there's so many uh, sub-series for that game. Is that... Oh yeah, it's like, we're not even getting into that. Uh, yeah, is they, that the they one kind of wanted Nero? to be like the Marvel of anime things, so it's just this clusterfuck, eventually. Yeah, is that the one with Nero? Yeah, that's the one with Red Saber, where they're in like the when they're in like uh, is it like a video game, digital world, die in the game, die in real life? I don't remember. Yeah, that's the one with Nero. One I'm thinking of. Apparently, Shinji's in it, and he's like an eight year old who wants to be elite Haxor. So yeah, they're they're not the original characters; they're just XPs, except the Rin character who might be the great granddaughter of the original Rin or something stupid. Just, just don't just don't get into don't ever try to connect the fate cannon. Just leave they it. They already did. They're all separate. Just just pretend they're all separate. It's canon. I don't care. <laughs> Anyways, to the reject demon Toko. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this it was this art style that really attracted me because it's not like the normal like usual heterosexual sexual type of character design you see. Like it's not all just big titty and big butts and soft features. There's like weird angles to all these characters, a lot of diverse body types, and just generally cool looking costumes. Like, no one looks exactly the same, and a few characters actually look like they came out of completely different games altogether. Like, the angel characters look like they just uh, wandered out of Skullgirls or something. Like, there's this one big angel guy wearing a striped tux, and he's, like, three times as tall as anyone else, and is wide. Like a security guard the size of a brick wall. <laughs> yeah, and he, like, breaks through a fucking brick wall, and I was like, that guy looks like he came from Skullgirls as, like, some background character. Do you ever even see that guy's head, now that I think about it? Or is it uh, I think there's uh, one CG Two different do. times. Oh. Mm. Yeah, I had uh, some screenshots, and one of them is when he's fighting a Devon, and the other one is when he's breaking through the brick wall. <laughs> he has red hair. Well, there you go. Tell nothing, us, what nothing. is the plot of the Reject Demon Toko? Right, the plot is, uh, we start the game in a flashback, and showing us our two main characters as kids, Toko and Nadia. Toko is a demon from hell who's job is going to be uh, f uh, taking human souls to hell and basically eating them because that's what demons have to do. They just go after whoever's died recently so they don't upset the balance. Her dad is this guy who looks like a uh, looks like Tommy Mick Jagger. Yeah, he looks like Mick <laughs> Jagger with uh, like red uh, star pass the pasties on his nipples. <laughs> He just looks ridiculous, but the entire time he's talking, just like some really nice dad who doesn't know what he's doing, and just like, what? <laughs> he's like the nicest guy, and he's so terrible at teaching his daughter things. So terrible that she thinks that when Nadia gives her a piece of paper that says soul on it, that she's completed her job, and her dad doesn't have the heart to correct her. <laughs> Maybe this is why Toko's so bad at collecting souls. <laughs> yeah, apparently, uh, she ends up, through, uh, several years, 
collects not one single soul because she can't bring herself to do it. And eventually, uh, hell in the heads of hell, this uh, lady named Palatrix, I think that's pronounced, yeah. is like, you know what? Fuck this. Uh, she uh, like shreds her file completely and just kicks her out. Yeah, it's basically this moment where she's like, well, we've talked to the, to the demon board of the demon school of the demon order, and you fucking suck. Get out of here. <laughs> I just love how she doesn't even, like, order guards to get her out. She's like, the door's that way. <laughs> Pretty much. Can't even be bothered to give a shit further What else that. are you going to do at that point? Anyways, uh, Togo ends up going to Earth where she runs into Nadia again, who uh, we learn later does still remember Toko and is pretty much just uh, been in love with her for a while. It's never established exactly when. But uh, the minute Nadia meets Toko, before we uh, uh, let all that sink in, she she instantly tries to trick Toko on going on a date with her. <laughs> and she's really good at it. <laughs> she like tricks her to go to uh, a restaurant to go to Let's a go get theater. a burger. Let's go get a movie. Let's go back to my place. <laughs> Let's sleep in my bed. Toko, do you have a house? No? Hey, I have one of those. <laughs> I just love how refreshingly straightforward she is about this. She's like, you know what? This girl's cute. She's going to be my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be real. That was one of the elements that kind of bothered me a bit. It is really because one in, in a series where romance is a big part of it, or at least, if not a romance, a relationship, it just very much it really nagged at me a lot. How it's just like we just have to accept that they care about each other out of nowhere. That I can understand, but my problem, like early on, I just sort of saw it as naughty as like, hey, this girl's cute. I want her to sleep in my bed. And that's as far as it goes, but... I mean, that's pretty quick. Yeah, but I mean, when it uh, keeps going and then you realize Nadia actually knows who's, has known who Toko is since the I beginning... I mean, I assumed from right away that she already could tell who she was, but... I didn't get that from the beginning. Even the... then, it still bothered me a bit because it's like, Hi, we met for five minutes once. Uh, well, I am now immediately attracted to you forever, so... No, I mean, like, my problem is when they uh, made it clear she knew who, to uh, who Toko was originally because they met as kids. It's not really mm -hmm. a foundation for the uh, love interest stuff. Yeah. I guess. It's the just last time I of, saw you, it's you just were like you kind old. of mix Stop both it, approaches at the same time, where it's not so much, hey, I recognize you, let's hang out, and they get closer. It's more so they get they're already in a relationship kind of from the get-go and then oh hey i remember you at least i will at the very least because i've seen other anime visual novel style things fuck this up really badly where they'll just go along and then show the flashback at least here they have the flashback from the beginning to establish these characters and what their deal is but i just feel like the jump there was a little too quick Honestly, I think if they just rewrote a few lines here and there, they could completely smooth this out. Which is like, she doesn't remember who Toko is until a bit later, but that doesn't really uh, change her opinion much. And she's mm -hmm. just kind of interested in her, and that's what gets her uh, so attached early on. Yeah, I think that definitely would have been a smarter, well, like a, a more well-flowing way to get it, because I was kind of just, upon reading this the first time, I was kind of just like, oh, well, we've just gone from zero to 60 in a second. Honestly, I would have right. liked that if they just made it clear that she didn't know who Toko was at first, and was just like, hey, you're a cute girl, let's date. <laughs> it also doesn't help that, uh, that throughout the uh, prelude, a lot of just random characters are like, hey, you, should, you two should totally fuck right now, and it's like, <laughs> uh... <laughs> I this will, is I will kind of defend hello, that. I will kind of defend that stupidity because they're like there was there was all one the scene where I thought it was funny, but for other ones I was just like, well, this is uncomfortable. Yeah, it's like all of them are basically uh, from like the lust section of hell, so that kind of makes sense. Mm. They're just like, eh, just fuck. We don't care. Pretty much. I kind of love how Nadia it. reacts every time. Like, oh, <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> She's not, like, disgusted or shy or anything. She's like, oh. <laughs> God, she has so many good lines in this one. Like, yeah. you've probably already seen why I changed the chat title, too. 
<laughs> oh god. <laughs> oh. You can tell the audience what it is. <laughs> Yeah, in uh, one of the final scenes of the novel, when they're just at home hanging out, uh, Toko says something sm- snarky, and she replies, you're not too old for a spanked bottom, young miss. <laughs> that this is, is what just... happens. God, there's so many good lines in this script. Yeah. Uh, it's just kind of a shame the plot... Well, the plot kind of works, but then it kind of doesn't. One very basic thing we have to get out of the way, which I will give credit because this is, like, to be fair, this is Act Zero. This is a prologue to an ongoing story, so we can only really talk about what's there so far. Right. Or kind of see where it goes with things, because I can see a few directions where this could go, where it could get, like, a lot more interesting with um, Toko and Nadia's relationship and how it kind of they inform each other because a lot of people meant uh, a lot of characters throughout the story mentioned where it's just like Toko is still a demon Nadia is still a human and there's going to be this inherent issue there where it's like if out of check uh, Toko could end up seriously hurting Nadia or like killing her by mistake by this bond they have so right uh, it's places just places going with that if it's like Toko is too brash causes damage or other things such as that, or Nadia won't voice her concern and everything. Yeah, it's. I could, uh, I could see. I could see that going into very good dramatic places between the two of them. Yeah, uh, what we're talking about is there's uh, the twist of the uh, after the first half of this episode is that Pelatrix uh, didn't actually plan to kick Toko out forever. She wanted to set up a situation that's activated her powers. Basically every demon has like a stand in the form of some sort of musical instrument. It's and a gear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically like that. And I uh, too. Just, to- I just name drop that. <laughs> <laughs> Toko has a very strong one named Epiphany, a bass guitar, but she, because she is so terrible at the whole soul eating thing, <laughs> she never had the power to summon it before. So she took a gamble and tried reintroducing her to Nadia, who she can spy on because she's also the dean of her college, apparently. <laughs> she actually just has a elevator that goes straight to hell in her skull, and she's like, "Oh yeah, well I Get can't go like up six, there, six, but six. and yeah, and like her uh, whole logic behind it is like." Well, I can't go up to the human world anymore, so I just have that elevator there if people need to see me. <laughs> One thing I do find funny is uh, Epiphany, the bass guitar, which is kind of um, Nadia's... I mean, no, not Nadia's. Uh, Toko's companion weapon instrument thing uh, is just a snarky asshole. <laughs> yeah, this... Uh, she reminded me a lot of, like, this arc in Bleach where all the Sampot Toad became actual people for a while and they all reflected different aspects of their users' personalities, and a lot of them were assholes. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, that's... that, And that was, like, the only good filler arc in that franchise. Also, one thing I'm trying to find out, and this is only relevant to me and people who play guitar or bass, but the bass is named Epiphany. Epiphone is a company that uh, makes basically the cheaper version of Gibson guitars and basses, and her bass is designed like an SG, which is, oh god, my audio is freaking out right now, um, but is uh, designed as an SG, which is a big Gibson Epiphone design, so I'm not sure if Epiphany was supposed to be a, fun, a pun with Epiphone. I hope it, it was. It probably was, considering the names of the other two high demons we made, and one of them's named like Aces High. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and another one's named Sweet Tooth Benny. I mean, come on, that's pretty on the nose. There you go. So yeah, uh, Toko has this power that awakens when she meets Nadia, thanks to uh, that whole thing from their childhood. They somehow kind of share a soul now, and so uh, Toko and a sheet of paper worked. <laughs> Yeah, and Toko's feelings for Nadia end up bringing out Epiphany, but because Toko is a brash idiot, she keeps overexerting herself and getting punched by giant angels, (laughs) and uh, she can't control Epiphany properly, and it takes a strain on Nadia, so this episode ends uh, establishing that Nadia is going to learn 
magic from the Russian, uh, legendary Russian witch Baba Yaga, who in this game is a butch, uh, dark-skinned grandma who is awesome. With a, with a talking chicken that she uses to communicate with them. <laughs> yeah, and even though there's no art for it, apparently she also travels around in a hut that is also a giant chicken. <laughs> Amazing. I want if only there was that. art for that. <laughs> Hopefully in the next episode. We'll so, see. So yeah, that's uh, basically this um, episode's establishing that, but it's also establishing uh, three different important factions, or more like five, uh, I'll explain in a moment. There's the demons under uh, Pelatrix. The other two uh, we see being Devon, uh, Toko's sister, who is such a fucking bitch. All the time, 24-7. Yeah. And to say this. That weirded me out because out of nowhere it's just like, it's me, your sister. I'm like, wait, she has a sister? This would have been nice to know or even have mentioned when she was with her dad, but... I think it's lightly mentioned uh, when we meet the it other one, uh, Ginso. I think that's how you pronounce it. It's a. I, I thought I thought it was Ginshao, but I don't. Ginshao know. makes a lot of sense. Ginshao is my favorite. She's fucking hilarious. Yeah, she's Ginshao just. Is my uh, favorite. She can't actually taste food, but she goes around buying like ungodly amounts of it with mm -hmm. money she makes playing saxophone and yep. just eats it because it, she like tastes the soul of the person who made it or something. Yep. She's also like, direct and blunt in the ways that make some very funny uh, comedic moments that I actually did find really funny. So Yeah, she's great. I would I would love her to get a spin off game one day. Hmm. But she anyways, get a spin off um, and it should be like a cooking mama style game. <laughs> Except instead no, of make a burger, it should be make three hundred burgers. <laughs> or it's like the hot dog eating competition, the game. <laughs> Right, so uh, Bellatrix uh, has is taking part in this uh, rock competition because rock music is literally from hell in this game. I love that Where, uh, canon thing. Yeah, I thought that was between funny. Uh, her and two other faction leaders, uh, Aces High and Sweet Tooth Benny, as I mentioned, who are the most ridiculously named characters. Mm. It, so, uh, so it's like Aces High, Sweet Tooth Benny, Bellatrix. <laughs> And uh, she uh, wants Toko on uh, to be in the band to win it because she has the most potentially powerful weapon because it's also implied this rock of battle is an actual battle and because Sweet Tooth Benny just outright threatens to murder people. That feel one. <laughs> <laughs> the other faction uh, is the one that is trying to protect Nadia, the witches. That being Baba Yaga and uh, Nadia's friend Steph, who turns out to also be a witch, just out of nowhere. But it kind of makes sense considering Nadia seems to just have a target on her back for weird shit, and Seth has probably been the one kind of keeping guard over her until yep. we hit this point. At the very least, there's not the anime trope of, why am I the only normal one here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, everyone's crazy and Nadia just goes along with, like, at first, sometimes she'll mm -hmm. be kind of annoyed that people are pulling her around, but the minute they say, okay, we want to train your witchcraft, she's like, sweet, when do I get my unicorn? Fuck yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I just love how gun-ho she is about all this weird stuff. Mm -hmm. Anyways, they're trying to protect her because witches are the people who are standing up for humanity because demons and angels are gigantic dicks that just eat humans and are like, nah, we're going to do something about that. And like Baba Yaga scares off a fucking angel with a fire sword and like uh, words that brainwash people and the angel's just like, okay, I don't want to fuck with that. <laughs> And, uh, and, of course, the angels are the third faction, basically the exact opposite of the demons. And even though they seem more orderly, they're, they think far less of humans as it becomes pretty clear. And they also fight with pop music, so you know they're evil. <laughs> I'm not making that up. Uh, one of them's literally a uh, pop idol. idol. <laughs> and she's That's just the worst. I think stuff with the angels will probably come to fruition a little more in later episodes, but it did bug me that they kind of just appear in order to have a convenient first baddie kind of to go up against, which, I mean, you know, it makes sense. You don't want to throw Toko right into, like, the demon battle of the bands thing right away, but this just felt like out of nowhere. 
I yeah, I kind of saw that, but I didn't mind because it kind of felt like this uh, entire episode felt like the first three episodes of an anime. A little. I just feel like it kind of, in a lot of ways, needed to introduce some things more. Because I mean, some of the um, narration scrolls where it shows like the demon city and it's like rock music literally came from hell or whatever. Your youth pastor was right, or something like that. <laughs> where it's got like a bunch of that stuff. I think. It's weird that those come up as frequently as they do, but there's certain big stuff with the world that doesn't get addressed. I think they're trying to hold their cards to their chest. Like, there's a lot being hinted at with what the angels were doing at the at this concert. We never oh, find definitely. out how what they're it did. In, how they're interfering. But like, I feel like they kind of needed to establish a little more that these factions exist or are a thing. Even just like a light mention, like. Yeah, uh, those fucking angels. Anyway. <laughs> Actually, there is something I kind of like about this that I uh, didn't... That if, you don't, or if you're not paying close attention, you may miss it, but it looks like the angels aren't getting along in some way. Like, oh, yeah. when that third angel comes down, uh, the idol angel is, like, genuinely unnerved, and she's not down with what this one's doing, but she can't fight back against it. Oh, yeah, she, she tell, she, you can tell the idol one uh, knows she's in trouble. Yeah, I don't. Th I don't think it's just that she knows she's in trouble. Like it kind of felt like she uh, felt kind of she didn't want what was about to happen to Toko to happen, but I don't know for what reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's like there's little hints that stuff's going on with them that I really liked. Like it's not like telling you everything up front; it's just leaving like little things for you to pick up on. And they actually did that with the demons too, because when the three high demons are talking, there's like little mentions of things that have happened in their past that doesn't get expanded upon. It's just like little hints. So yep. you start to realize everything that's going on is way bigger than it actually seems. And you're kind of wondering how it's supposed to come together later. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we... So basically what this game is setting up is um, Toko, this demon who got this incredible power that she can't actually use properly and a random human girl she uh, ended up helping instead of taking her soul are become centerpieces in this big giant thing between like three different mystical factions all at each other's throats. Yeah. And also uh, Toko's terrible sister and uh, the girl who likes to eat a lot are there and they do stuff. Yeah. True. I like I the story, but if I had to explain it the way you've been explaining it, the only way I could do it would be in, like, two minutes talking non-stop and eventually sounding kind of bored. <laughs> the way that it's just like, so, okay, so there's Toko and there's Nadja and the relationship and, oh, and the sister, and uh, demons, demons and angels, instruments, angels, and Dan Brown and, is there. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, yeah, and then Negan kills two people instead of one. So, oops. We can follow. Oh, I. Uh, <laughs> if you're wondering why it's uh kind of feels a little loosely structured, apparently uh I think the first third of this game was originally part of a of a game jam, and then it got expanded out into this full episode we have here. Oh. Hmm. So like uh the stuff with the relationship would have been standalone, and everything else was added in later. I'm not sure when the cutoff was for the content. Still, if they were to adapt that from a game jam, they probably should have pruned what they had to and backwrote a lot of things. I would play the game if it was just Toko and Nadia just adjusting to everyday life. I'll still just buy like, the future episodes, but that's the storyline that I'm kind of most interested in, just Toko and Nadia make a nice couple, and there's all this stuff about instruments and a rock concert band contest. Oh yeah, those two are just like the best couple. <laughs> yeah. I kind of love how uh, you think uh, I kind of expected a certain uh, chemistry between them based on all the all of the anime tropes I absorbed over the years and then Nadia, the moment she meets Toko in adult life, is like, hey, you're cute. You're going to be my girlfriend. I'm like, okay, I'm sold. This is completely <laughs> different from anything I've ever seen. How fucked up is that? I just end. like how how open she is about this stuff, just like how direct she is. There's like no bullshitting, just like straight to the fucking point. Thank you. 
Yeah, uh, once again, I'd like that more if they did a better job of kind of establishing the attraction between them early on, because it really does just, like, come out of nowhere. It's like, oh, okay, well, I guess they're a thing now. All right, well, I guess they're hanging out now. Okay, well, I guess they're inseparably bonded now. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it does go a little too fast in that area, but I think the quick pace helps with everything else just right. Eh, I, I'm, I have to disagree on there. I feel like it just feels like so much is being thrown at once that where it's like there's all that, then there's all these factions, then there's all this all, all these things, and then ultimately you got your power, but also we tricked you, you weren't actually here. It it feels like I I don't feel like they develop enough on the ideas they set up, which granted, you know, it's an early part and later things are going to do it, but I feel like it's going too fast for its own good or focusing too much on the wrong things in presenting I, the story. I would agree with that, except I like how it segments all this information so cleanly, so you're never, like, overwhelmed all at once. Yeah, I never felt overwhelmed. There was never a point where it felt, like, confusing or difficult to follow. I just felt like it was kind of... I don't want to say hastily put together, because that's not really what I get. It, it seems kind of like they're just trying to shove in a lot of information at once, which, you know, exposition is exposition. That is a thing. Yeah, I kind but of get it, because... The, the way they're trying to cram it in just feels... Like I they're trying too I, hard to cram it I think it I uh, get your problem. It's because it's structured in an episodic way within this one episode. So it doesn't feel like a cohesive part of a greater whole. It feels like three parts of a greater whole just uh, smashed together. Yeah, and the problem when you have kind of that breakneck way of presenting that information is it makes, at least for me anyway, I can't speak for other people, but um, a lot of the bigger scenes kind of lose a lot of impact. <laughs> Yeah, it's kinda... just the, the case of, oh, I guess this is happening now. Or it's like, oh, okay, I guess this is going on now. It just yeah, kind I, of just keeps going. I get what you're saying. I kind of felt the same. Uh, when you get when it hit the angel part, everything was just moving so fast that there wasn't much time to take a scene in as well as I wanted to. Yep. But at the same time, I appreciate the game that actually respected my fucking time. Because I cannot tell you how fucking bored I get of visual novels usually by that point. And the game still had me engaged, so I figured, you know what, this is better than the alternative I've seen so far. I'm down with this. It's just like not one, perfect, I'm the one but human on Earth who likes I the first think five, it's hour, five hours of Umineko, so... <laughs> well, one of, like... I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but... Uh, you're Part of up the there. thing with visual novels is ultimately yeah. the big thing there is novel, and you need to set up a lot and things like that, and stuff like pacing and the way stuff is Le doled Potter, out buddy. is very important. And while a lot of visual Snake? novels take way too long in the beginning sections, Domo kind of laying Mr. out Roboto. a lot of exposition and things before all the good shit Snake? happens, I feel like cr uh, cramming it all together doesn't exactly do a great job either. Hello? Snake. You there? Oh, yes. Yeah, you know. All right, we're here. Okay, yeah, you cut off talking about Yumi Nikki or something like that. Uh, Umineko, but don't worry. The stuff got recorded into the podcast, so we're good. Hooray! Okay, you uh, continue us where you, uh, wherever you want to leave off. Uh, basically, the main thing that I... Uh, the main tenet of that, uh, barring the stuff about Umineko, is while having a very slow, deliberate slow start can negatively affect the story, I feel like cramming in a lot of the information can have the opposite problem where it just makes the pacing this mess, which was an issue I had with uh, Toko. Yeah, that's uh, perfectly fair. I understand that. I kind of got that feeling, too, which is I vastly prefer when a video game respects my time because I have played so much drawn-out bullshit in my life that just, like, even if it's not perfect pacing, even if it's very choppy or messy... If it's not wasting my fucking time, I will cut it a bit of slack. Eh, that's a personal point, I guess. Yeah, because yeah, let me tell you, I've been playing Doom 3 on three hours in, <laughs> and, like, nothing has fucking happened. I mean, the, granted, the gates of hell did open up, but nothing else has happened. Also, a thing I don't want to rag on too much on Toko, because it, I understand it was by a small, uh, very small team, uh, but... I definitely think this game would have benefited a lot from having uh, more sprite, not necessarily more sprites, but more sprite poses for the characters. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. generally between, I understand, it, with this level of art, you kind of have to put a lot of effort, and it's not as simple as like, just draw another one. There's a lot that goes into that and everything, but when every single character has one pose that they hold with different uh, clothes drag, like uh, drawn over, or just a different face expression, or a little anime sweat bead, or angry uh, pulse, it really kills the impact of some scenes when it's like, in one fight with the angels, it's like, Toko and this angel are fighting, so we're just gonna ram their sprites at each other, and now Toko's upside down, or whatever. And uh, once again, I don't want to brag on it too much, because I understand it's a small team, they're working with what they have to. And the quality of the sprites, in terms of, like, the actual art and design of it, is very, very good, but it really is distracting when there's the one pose for all of them. I think we're gonna know if, uh... They've uh, learned their lesson from this when uh, Star when uh, the Stargazers comes out because I've been watching it for a while and it mm-hmm. looks much more professional, mainly because it's actually a full complete game that they uh, nice. not an episodic release. Cool, cool. Yeah, once again, it's a thing I don't want to rag on too much and everything, but it really does show a lot where it's kind of. Like, you see, if you look on the Steam page, you see the sprite of Toko with her hand, uh, one hand on her hip and the other one down. She will never not make that pose unless it's a CG, so. Yeah, that they definitely need to add more poses. Hopefully that'll happen in the future episodes. Yeah, I hope so too. Apparently they've been working on three projects at the same time. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, they've been working on episodes for Toko. They're trying to get the next three episodes, which I think are the only three. Mm-hmm. done at around the same time so they don't release too far apart they're also working on another game that's actually a remake of the first game uh, Talisum ever released called Dizzy Hearts because he mm-hmm. wants to give it a proper actual good art that it deserves and an actual good design and of gotcha. course there's the Stargazers which is about to be released on November f- 4th or 5th I believe nice so they've been pretty busy. <laughs> we got the funny thing where this is where time gets screwed up because released on November 4th or 5th, that's probably going to be <laughs> before yeah, this episode as goes as I out. said earlier, it's going to be out by the time this episode's out. See, audience, we have a transparent screen. You know where all your PayPal money is going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Listen, I do want to bring up one other me. thing about this game. Okay. I like the music, but I don't like how it's looped. Explain. I, because yeah, you, uh, you I, know actually, I actually didn't thing? notice that as much. I had um, I was mainly focusing on the reading for it, so I wasn't... Um, does it not have a seamless loop, or is there like a gap in the audio for it? Or? No, I mean, uh, did you... Uh, you know that uh, song that plays whenever there's a big action scene going on with uh, yeah, yeah. the Epiphany? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that uh, that piece sounds a little out of tune at first, which I think was intentional because it's trying to like be uh, the four characters in the band uh, trying to get in sync before they go all out. Mm. Except they're using it in all the wrong spots because not all four of them are together, like playing a song or something. And it also has very slow build-up before it hits that uh, nice payoff, and then it loops again and back into uh, the build-up. If yeah, the it might goes be. On. They, it might have helped if they broke the, like uh, broke different parts of it into separate tracks for different scenes or different arrangements. But I understand that takes a lot to do. Yeah, I, uh, I'm kind of spoiled now because I've been playing Lady Kill in her bind, and it has this really cool uh, system in it for the soundtrack that. It basically has several tracks, but each track has multiple versions of it that weave mm-hmm. in and out of each other as the tone of the scene changes, or we transition oh, nice. to like the scenes with the brothers. So it always mm-hmm. sounds like the same song, but it has completely different tone and feel to it. I'm mm-hmm. kind of hoping they do something. They try doing something like that for like future episodes. Yeah. I can or at see that. least like make it loop a little better during the long mm. scenes. Yeah, it can be hard. There's often a thing where you got to set like a certain looping point and everything, which is definitely worth the effort to do because the results are a lot. <laughs> it, it really shows. 
Yeah, I've been uh, paying attention to this group for a while, and they really seem to care about all the stuff they're making because they're not like making gangbusters off this, especially since Toko is the only commercial release they have right now, I believe. Oh, damn. Yeah, so they've uh, been uh, funding with a Patreon so far, but they're like, nice. it's mainly just all passion work for them. Absolutely. They also, they also brought up something I like to talk about real quick. Okay. It is uh, related. Uh, the Towson actually went on a bit of a rant at uh, a few weeks ago about the state of the Western visual novel development oh uh, scene. <laughs> And I kind of get oh what boy. he's saying. I'm not going to go too far into it, but basically it's a very derivative and a hard to uh, get into scene. Like, have you ever noticed how many Western-made visual novels just all kind of do the same thing or have the same sort of art style? Like, yep. even the good... All, all the Sakura games, Honey Pop, uh, oh, no, Go, so I Go, think the Nippon, Sakura games are actually made in Japan. Oh, are they? Okay, oh. I'd be wrong then. But yeah, like like uh, fooled, stuff though. like the Hanako uh, games, like Long Live the Queen or Science Girls, stuff like that. Okay. Or other uh, groups like Winter Wolves, who did Lore and the Amazon Princess, which is very good, by the way. Mm -hmm. They all have kind of a habit of just using the same sort of art style over and over, and even for good releases, it's kind of hard to tell what is a good release, because it's just all kind of the same looking. Hmm. Like, especially on Steam, where all the titty games are going, there's a shit ton of them. <laughs> yeah, and those are kind of shoved to the forefront because they sell, so... Yep. Yeah, and a lot of them just have really poor art. Yeah. And not, like, interesting poor art. What are proportions? <laughs> not, like, interesting poor art either, just... just plain bad titty art. <laughs> <laughs> so... This is why I want to support things like Toko, because just by looking at it for just a few seconds, you can tell this is not the same old thing we keep seeing over and over. Just from the art style alone, it just has me fascinated. It's, uh... It's also, a ha the, uh, sorry to interrupt, but one thing I want to point out, which I should have said during the thing when I was complaining about the sprites, uh, Toko has really, really good backgrounds. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, fucking oh, fantastic yeah. backgrounds, actually. Yeah, they're Very just, colorful. There's a lot of depth in them, and I think that was really good. Despite all the shortcuts this game took, there are like a lot of parts that just pop really well, like all those chibi art pieces. I think like, that's always a very smart way for uh, visual novels to... I don't want to say cut corners, because that sounds condescending, and a lot, like a ton of games do it. A lot of games I like do it, and I like when they do it in Toko as well. Uh, it's just a very smart way to convey like a smaller, more casual scene without having it be... like without having to break the bank on it. Yeah, it's just like, you get, you get the idea and you get cute art and that's good. Yep, uh, the original Muff Love does that actually. Where for a yeah. lot of the um, uh, lighter scenes and everything, they'll use kind of the chibi art to represent it because, it, once again, it's quicker to draw. It's, it's a pretty useful shortcut to do, provided it's not your only shortcut, you know? I want to try that series, but I know the first game is just high school students doing... Uh, random bullshit and I just want to get straight to the monster killing. Uh it's complicated. What yeah, I recommend what, I what I'd recommend is what I did, which is a lot of people don't recommend this and I regret it a little bit, but it let me get to the good stuff faster was read a plot synopsis for extra, which is the first one. Excuse me. Uh read the manga for Unlimited, which is kind of uh, alien fighting the second one They're but up uh, again. the training for it uh, and then read all of Alternative and Alternative okay. is fucking amazing so that's probably the way I'd recommend it though right now Alternative is not on Steam but it will be at some point yeah I uh, there's a lot of visual novels that are finally getting released on Steam but have you noticed they're all priced at ridiculously high prices <laughs> Uh, I saw Clan Ad was kind of high, but granted, that thing's like 100 hours long. I, uh, which I don't have time for that. <laughs> all the Higurashi episodes are seem like they're better priced until you realize just how many episodes there actually are. And it adds I mean, up there's, very fast. There's eight in, yeah, there's eight in total. Well, uh, what do they have the prices at? Let me check this real quick. 
I'm glad what they did for, um, I'm just gonna, oop, search. But, uh, one thing that I really like for, uh, Umineko, because it's a 7th expansion game, uh, same writer as, uh, Higurashi, is when that came out on Steam, they just released the entire question arc. So it's episodes 1 through 4, $25, flat, go. And I'm like, thank you. I think that's understand? just because that one wasn't as popular as Higurashi was, so they couldn't milk the fans as much. Well, see, the rationale that I've heard for Higurashi, which is one thing that really bugs me about the way they're doing it on Steam, is how staggered the releases are. And the reason I've heard for it is because they're trying to emulate how the game came out, where it was sold at uh, Kamiket, the um, independent like um, games and art convention selling and what they Japan. actually mean is they want to milk a domutaku for all their money they want to take they want to take a long time with it i think it would have been much smarter if they just released like all of the question arcs at once and all the an uh, answer arcs at once but yes but they wouldn't have made as much money no they probably would have made the same money <laughs> the people who like higurashi would have bought it anyway <laughs> probably i wish i played yeah, but more visual novels <laughs> visual novels are a strange time According yeah, to I, really have not played, I, I really have not played the that many, but I know a good amount about them. Apparently Phoenix Wright is technically a visual novel, but other than it that... Is. It is. It absolutely yeah. is. Also, I'm Thank now you. remembering that Katawa Shoujo is approaching like four or five years old at this point. <laughs> wow. I really still weird. need to get around to playing that. That game's good. It, it might be better to play now after the hype has died down, because I remember when that was like the hot shit. Yeah. That I'm game's good though. I'm in this weird space where I want the Western uh, visual novel scene to do much better than it is, especially because it's attracting a lot of queer creators, which is a very good thing for this medium. Absolutely. But at the same time, there's so much crap, and it's everywhere. I mean, that's one of the things we're going to get. It's it's a double-edged sword, silver no, lining kind of thing. No, I mean, like... It, on one hand, it's great that they're... Well, Overall, I'd prefer having more games than less games. I think more people working on games is a very good thing. But unfortunately, no, I mean, that the means problem, there's going to be crap. The problem I'm having, sorry, the problem I'm having is it's coming in the same situation as horror games on Steam. You know what oh, I mean? Like, Christ. where it's yep. a lot of lazily made, uh, slapped together stuff yep. just shoved out there for fast money. I'm so sad because at one point Amnesia was the game that was like, yes, it brought back horror games. Now it's like, wow, it's the game that ruined horror games. <laughs> no, that wasn't. No, it was Slender that did that. That's yeah, true. Five Nights at Freddy's. By Friday. taking everything from. There we go. There we I go. will. Def I will defend Five Nights at Freddy's because that one isn't as copied as much as you think it would be. Yeah. It's and it's, honestly, got, it's copied a pretty good amount. I, what what I will give up, with it. But, what I will give Five Nights at Freddy's is it has a very unique mechanic and style of playing for it. Yeah. I hate, I'm hate. i not really a fan of the game itself. I hate the jump scares and I hate the loud fucking noise because yeah. it's not scary, it's just irritating. Oh, I but agree with that, but I I will defend I that like the most recent game actually changes the play style every single night. Mm. Nice. So yeah, yeah they I th are, I think they it's are trying unique. to do something with it. I think it has a very unique mechanic to call its own, so I definitely... I'm okay with it getting the attention it did. Yeah, anyways, all okay I'm saying is enough with the terrible titty games, please. I still love the one video where... I, I'm pretty sure this one is actually a Japanese visual novel, but the one uh, screenshot from the one YouTube video where it's just like, Neko para comes from the Japanese word Neko, which means cat, and para, which means I love to disappoint my parents. <laughs> 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 Oh god, I just remembered there was a game on Steam where it's basically a puzzle game where the where you win, you get to see anime titty, but it, like a cartoon dad keeps popping in your room to see what you're doing the whole time. If you get caught doing the puzzle, you'll get That's mad funny. and say he's disappointed. You know, you think it's funny, but then you realize it is the worst idea of a video mm -hmm. game ever made. Why do I need a game for that? I have real life parents. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I think we're all kind of mixed on this game, but I'm definitely in the more positive headspace on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a kind of thing where, well, overall, I'd say my opinion on it is much more... Ne uh, well, not much more, but uh, I don't... I, once again, I don't want to be too harsh. I, I understand passion projects like these, and I feel my criticisms are founded, and I don't mean to be harsh about them. But um, 
I'm, it may be a thing that I don't personally enjoy as much, but I'm glad it exists, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah I get that. I'm glad people can work on this and kind of do their own mm. thing, and even if it's totally not my thing, that they can have it be successful in their eyes and people can enjoy it. Yeah. I'm going to go all pretentious and arty, and I'm making hand gestures just waving around in front of my screen that you can't see them. But visualize yeah, them. I think the this, brain. <laughs> I think this game could really be a metaphor for um, for like <laughs> from what you've described of the the whole scene of visual novels in the West, because there's a lot of really good ideas in this game, and but there's quite a lot of them, and they're all crammed in, and they none of them really get enough space to be as good as they could be, and they're still good. I am still going to play it. I really want to. I, I like Toko and I like Nadia, but nice. there's wouldn't hurt to take things a little bit slower. Mm. Develop what I you have def- instead of chucking in another element. Yep. No, I definitely to be am fair. glad we addressed the state of uh, Western visual novels because it's uh, it's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> now to be fair, they do need to make money, so they got to get stuff shipped eventually. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's something I've noticed a lot when uh, game developers are talking on Twitter. Eventually, oh, absolutely. Yeah, eventually it will come down to you. Sometimes you just gotta ship what you got done. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I was. Um, I listened to uh, Giant Bomb a lot, the uh, Bombcast and the Beastcast. And on the on an old Beastcast episode, they were talking with one uh, game developer, and uh, she was working on a rhythm game, and was kind of going through not even as much the process of making it where like yes some of that but more so marketing it and getting it out and having to like having all this kickstarter money that she got from and how you actually have to manage that and how it can be very very difficult to do and make sure things are going correctly and at the end of the day you still need to ship a product so it's it's tough it definitely is yeah i would definitely recommend this one because it's only five dollars for this one episode and there's more coming out and I think it's going to come out just fine. So if you like this uh, first episode and you want more of it, you can get more of it later. Or technically the zeroth episode. Yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine anyone coming in on episode one and being able to pick it up without playing Yeah, unless this. there's like some, unless there's some like previously on <laughs> previously on Demon Toko. <laughs> and it's just the entire episode. <laughs> yeah. Just no, it, no, it's just like recently on Reject Demon Toko. These girls were really gay. Like, really, really gay. They and just met and they're already sleeping in bed. <laughs> and now we continue their story. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm always down for more gay, so this gets a thumbs up for me. I need Bara Titty. <laughs> so. I can't gay anime girls, I need gay anime boys. <laughs> If the devs do, oh god, need... that's gonna be hard to find. I know. Yeah, I mean, Steam so is not many... exactly a place for that. Yeah, so many of them are bit shonens. I noticed a lot. There's mm. not really a lot of like uh, these games being made for gay guys, just for women who were really into gay men. If you get my yeah. drift, it happens. I don't think there's anything wrong with women being attracted to gay men, but it's like when it gets when it's all one style and not at all for the audience it could be. I'm like. Guys, <laughs> yeah, there's a reason. I, I understand really folks don't want to ship it because it probably won't sell. But uh, <laughs> oh well. If the devs do want to make some quick money, about twenty pounds, I'm willing to pay. Um, this was one of the biggest, one of the most passionate suggestions I have for this because, yeah, I am a complete visual novel rookie. I, I'm not sure if any of and my an anime is. rookie, I know and that. an anime rookie, and a manga rookie, and the rookie at everything, pretty much. I'm kind of surprised the anime titty didn't scare you. <laughs> I was terrified. That was. I'm gonna say I was nervous when I, uh, when you named this on the last episode, and I look on the page, and there's the one screenshot where <laughs> viewers at home, you'll know. <laughs> If you look up this game, you'll know. Uh, please don't use that screenshot as the episode <laughs> thing. <laughs> oh, please do. <laughs> please do not. Okay. <laughs> but hey, it worked. It sold. Yeah. There you go. Uh, yeah, the, the thing I feel very 
passionately about is um, near the beginning on one of the introductory screens it talks about Toko's home and the underworld and it says there's many different names that mortals have given the underworld Hell, Noraka, Tartarus, Du, and I'm deadly serious because I know that sometimes devs can listen to these things if you put Croydon in with those names 20 pounds <laughs> because that will genuinely get you like a British fan base. You just gotta make fun of Croydon. And Amazing. And the, you know it deserves to be there. So <laughs> you heard it here first. Yeah. I don't. We don't want any emails from anyone from there. <laughs> they don't have computers in Croydon. You don't have to worry. <laughs> <laughs> This is the part where we get really shitty and just be like, go back to your garbage city. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I just want to rag on Ricky Gervais again. Ricky Gervais, I mean, not he, hard. he was born in Croydon. <laughs> I'm just... <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> oh is that God. like the New Jersey of England? I, might be. I don't know if New Jersey's bad enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh it, it, it's it is the worst place imaginable. Well, there you go, New Jersey, twin with Croydon. There we go. <laughs> I swear, I'm actually being serious. If the devs are listening, because you know you want to add some, you get a little bit of comedy, get a little bit of Croydon bashing. Everything's fine. It'll be good. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry, it'll sell. Yeah, I will be a, me. a dedicated fan. Right now, I'm a fan. I will be a dedicated fan. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Toko, check it out. It's very game good, and I like it. Video games. And now we need to talk about we're gonna what we're going to look at for the next episode. And I believe Lamar has the next pick. It's the truth. So this one will be easy for both of you because you both already own it. I think. Hey. Oh, thank God. Uh, <laughs> uh, the game is going to be 140. Oh. It is oh, a okay. rhythm it is a rhythm based <laughs> uh platformer with a lot of color and uh level design synced to music. So oh, it'll yeah, change I based do on it. That. Yep. So that should be an interesting one. Yeah. Also as soon as this episode is over I'm probably gonna just gonna buy Hyperlight Drifter because I need that. <laughs> <laughs> I need it. <laughs> God Lamar. I almost bought the soundtrack to that last night. Because <laughs> I have no self-control. But yes, uh, 140 will be the next episode. I'm by the, the way, one who's you got to break the bank for $5. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. You know Phil from the Westport Independent? Yeah. He lives in Croyd. <laughs> <laughs> and we end there. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck Phil. <laughs>